Okay. <coughs> okay, we're going to do um, lipids and proteins today. That's unit uh, 11. Um, we covered um, carbohydrates last time, and we saw that members of the carbohydrate class um, had, you know, a certain general formula. They had a certain ratio of carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. Um, they had um, structures that we could recognize uh, in terms of the monosaccharides. Um, they had characteristic bonding, alpha 1,4, beta 1,4. <coughs> Unfortunately, lipids aren't like that. Uh, lipids uh, don't have uh, common structural features that place them into this particular class of biological macromolecules. Lipids uh, are really defined um, by their function, or they have a more operational definition. Um, and a lipid is, is really anything, anything that comes from a living organism that doesn't dissolve, or that does dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Um, that means that it doesn't dissolve appreciably in water. Okay? Um, something that dissolves in nonpolar solvents won't dissolve in water. And <clears throat> I'm sure that you know many of you have seen you know you're you're sitting over the water or you're at the lake or you know in a pond or something and you and you spit and you know you spit in the water and it, and it stays together it's shaking your head no you do it it, it stays and floats <clears throat> because it, it's non polar it's hydrophobic um, you know sometimes it can be any number of, of, of things that come out of your lungs surfactant proteins things like that um, but either way. Uh, they're the lipid class because they don't mix or dissolve well uh, in water. <clears throat> so that's our operational uh, definition. There is a, a, this is a very, very diverse group, very diverse. I should probably highlight uh, that word. Um, many different subclasses, and we're not going to cover them all, okay? Um, we will look at fats and oils, which are essentially the same thing. It's just the makeup of the fatty acids that are esterified to, to the uh, glycerol that differentiates them. We'll look at phospholipids and steroids. We'll leave the carotenoids out. Um, you know, if you go on and you take a, a one semester survey in biochem, or you take a three semester, uh, quarter, three quarter, a sequenced um, biochem um, set of classes, you're gonna, you're gonna see as much of those as you want. Um, and a lot of this is, is just, you know, reading, and, and I know that you all can read, so I'm not going to spend all the time reading this word for word, right? but the slides are here, um, they're going to be on, on the web, so um, you can take the time to, uh, to read those, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's break our, break our um, setup, our, our lipids, into two broad classes, uh, fatty acid containing lipids, and non-fatty acid containing lipids. Um, if we're using uh, fatty acids, um, you know, we need to know what a fatty acid is. And we'll see in just a minute. We already know. We already know what one is. Our fatty acids are going to be our triacylglycerols. These are our fats and oils. Uh, again, we'll see why uh, some are solid at room temperature and why some are liquids at room temperature. Um, they'll include also our waxes and then our phospholipids, um, which are sometimes referred to as phosphoglycerides. Our non-fatty acid containing lipids, we're only going to deal with one class, the steroids. Right? The steroids. <clears throat> well, let's see what a fatty acid is. We already know what a fatty acid is. These are just long hydrocarbon chains with a carboxylic acid functional group on the end. That's all they are. They're carboxylic acids. Only they have long carbon chains, long hydrocarbon chains. Um, the hydrocarbon chains, or the number of carbons in the chain, for some reason, <clears throat> appears to be even uh, in, in the lipids. It's odd. It's just an observation, but it's odd. Um, 12, 12, 12, 13, 14, 15. They've got 12 CH2 groups, 13, 14. Um, 
the number of carbons in our fatty acid chains is an even number. Now, the fatty acids, again, don't, don't freak out on this. They're, they're nothing more than carboxylic acids. That's all they are. They're carboxylic acids with long carbon chains after them. We're not used to seeing long carbon chains because we memorized the first 10 alkanes, right? Um, and these are bigger than that. Um, but still, it's, it's nothing more than carboxylic acid uh, functional groups. Um, these carbon chains uh, can be saturated or unsaturated uh, depending on the presence or absence of the carbon-carbon double bonds. If you have carbon-carbon double bond, you are unsaturated. We know this, right? We know alkenes were unsaturated. Alkynes were unsaturated um, hydrocarbons. So this is nothing new to us. Uh, the answer is no. You don't have to memorize these. I know you're all thinking that. You do not have to memorize these uh, along with their formulas, but you should recognize them. You know, you should be able to recognize, hey, car carboxylic acid with, you know, uh, 18 carbon chain, that's a fatty acid. <clears throat> there is a, 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 an abbreviation or a short-term short representation way to, to show these fatty acid chains. Um, and what the first number is, is the total number of carbons in the chain. Now remember, that includes the carbonyl carbon. This one has 12 CH2 groups, which means 12 carbons, one for each CO2. Then it's got one here for 13 and one here for 14. Okay, don't leave out that carboxylic acid carbon. People tend to do that. So the first number tells you how many carbons are in the chain. The second number, followed after a full colon, tells you how many double bonds you have, how many points of unsaturation. So obviously, for saturated fatty acids, saturated means they're saturated with their maximum number of hydrogens. And in order to unsaturate them, you have to remove two hydrogens to create the double bond. So when you have less than the maximum number of hydrogens, they call you unsaturated. Okay. So for our, our saturated fatty acids, these are all going to be zeros because by definition, saturated fatty acids don't have any carbon-carbon double bonds. Once you get into the unsaturated ones where you have carbon-carbon double bonds, You'll see 16, this is 16 carbons, colon 1 means I have one double bond, and where does it begin? At carbon number 9. That's what that delta 9 is. Okay. Down here, linolenic acid, for example, 18 colon 3 means it's got three double bonds, carbon chains 18 carbons long, with carbon number 1 being the COOH, the carboxylic acid functional group, right? Because we always number the chain with priority given to the functional group. So this is always going to be car carbon number one. So 18-3, I have double bonds going from 9 to 10, 12 to 13, and 15 to 16. This always gives us the first carbon, the number of the first carbon, in the double bond. Okay? Um, and uh, yes, that's what this is. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, if we have an unsaturated fatty acid, we have a carbon carbon double bond, right? We know carbon carbon double bonds could take two configurations the geometric isomers, right? Cis and trans. Whenever you have an option for cis or trans, in nature, generally, the trans form is more favored because the trans form maximizes the distance between the substituted groups. So let's say you had a long hydrocarbon chain here, maybe eight carbons long, and then this one was four or five carbons long. If they're on the same side of the ring, they can, or the double bond, they can kind of flex around 
they can smack into each other. Okay, this is called steric hindrance. It's called sterics. And that increases the overall energy of the molecule. So usually when you have uh, uh, cis and trans isomers, the trans one is the one that is uh, more favored in nature. Now, <clears throat> having said that, <laughs> when you see the double bonds in the unsaturated fatty acids, they are not in the trans form. They're actually in the cis form. They have a cis, and what happens is, if you look here, okay, let's take a look. These are space filling diagrams, right? They're not little pictures of a uh, caterpillar or something. These are space filling diagrams, and what they attempt to do is, is show you um, what, what space would be occupied by the atom and the electron clouds around the covalent bond. So it tries to give you some feel for what these things look like uh, if you could look at them under a microscope. So <clears throat> here's a fatty acid chain. There's our C double bond O, single bond O. Notice that it's deprotonated. Okay, the carboxylic acid is deprotonated. And I think the reason for that is, is that you, you know, this is biochemistry, and we want to know what these things look like in the body. And at physiological pH, which is about 7.4, 7.35, that carboxylic acid would be deprotonated. Okay, in fact, it's going to lose that proton anything above probably 2.4, 2.5 pH. So I think, you know, and, and I agree with this. I, I'm only concerned with the form as it exists in our body. I don't care how it exists outside the body because I want to see how this thing behaves in vivo, in my body, right? So, this is our, our, our carboxylic acid functional group, it's carboxylate, right? We go down and we identify our double bond. Here it is. See our double bond? Now look at the two substitutions. The two bonds coming off the double bond are on the same side of the double bond. That makes it cis, right? Does everybody see how that's cis? See this double bond? Cis. Right? See this double bond? Cis. <clears throat> so everybody see how it kinks the chain? Puts a big kink in the chain. We're going to see the consequences of that in just a moment. Notice our saturated fatty acids, one that, have, that has no uh, double bonds in it, is a nice straight chain. You can almost imagine a lot of these just lining up on each other and packing very close together. Whereas these ones can't because of the kink in the chain. Okay? Everybody good? So far? Those kinks, we're going to see the issue they create. Just a minute. Okay, our, fat, our uh, saturated fatty acids, we can name them um, you know, a number of different ways. They have the common names, which we just saw, which you don't have to memorize. But also, if they have one double bond, they're monounsaturated. If they have two, they're um, um, di. If they have many, uh, well, actually, we're, we're going to differentiate right there. Two or more double bonds is polyunsaturated. Okay, there are essential versus non-essential fatty acids. Uh, non-essential fatty acids mean um, that we don't have to take them um, in our diet. Our body has the ability to produce these fatty acids from other precursors. The essential fatty acids cannot be synthesized by living organisms and therefore these particular fatty acids must be supplied by diet. You will not be asked to differentiate on the exam between essential and non-essential fatty acids. That's just some information that I'm giving. Incidentally, most, most nuts, seeds, peanuts, uh, you know, sunflower seeds, these are all very good sources uh, for fatty acids. Now remember, not so long ago, Carboxylic acids 
can react with alcohols to produce esters, right? You better know that. An examiner. Carboxylic acids react with alcohols and dehydration to produce esters, right? Well, our fatty acids are all carbo carboxylic acids. So we can almost see where we're going on this. So we're going to take those fatty acids and we're going to react them with OH groups and we're going to produ uh, produce ester linkages. And we're going to do it on a single molecule called a glycerol. This is glycerol. It's a three carbon chain with OH groups on every single carbon. Now, this is not a sugar, right? Even though each carbon possesses an OH group, there's no aldehyde or ketone group. There's no carbonyl. There's no C double bond O anymore. Glycerol is nothing more than a three carbon chain with each carbon containing an OH group. This OH group can react with carboxylic acid functional groups to create ester linkages. Now, depending on whether we have one ester, two, or three, that would mean we have a monoglyceride, diglyceride, or triglyceride. Now, most properly, they're called acylglycerides, or acylglycerol, because this is an acyl group. Everything, if you were to cut right here, everything to the right of that oxygen is referred to as an acyl group, an OCHEM. So, I will refer to them as triacylglycerols. But, you could call them triacylglycerides, triglycerides, triglycerols. These are probably what our, what our parents call them. Okay? Here's an example. Here's the glycerol molecule right here. Might be a little hard to see, but there's our three carbon uh, chain. These are where our OH groups were. We esterified them to fatty acid chains and we produced a triacyl glycerol. Now, mono and diacyl glycerols do exist, but they're in relatively low concentrations because these things are generally you know, intermediates on the way to the triacyl glycerol. They do exist, which is not in very high um, uh, concentrations. Now, the fatty acid chains here have really no parameters and no requirements on length. Okay, but what we do see is rarely do you see, see how these are all saturated? You see how there's no double bonds here? We don't see unsaturated fatty acids mixed with saturated fatty acids. They're either all going to be saturated, like our example here. Notice these are carbon chains of different length. So they don't all have to be the same one. But notice there are no double bonds here. We don't see that mixture. And if there were double bonds there, then all three of them would have double bonds in them. Okay, we don't mix saturated with unsaturated. They don't like each other. I don't know why. Don't care. Everybody good? Okay. If we had, I'm going to back up because I don't think I have a slide of it. But if we back up, imagine what this would look like if we put in are unsaturated fatty acids. Okay? If you had these hooked onto the glycerol, you would have kinks in this chain, right? All of them would have kinks. And because of those kinks, the, the triacylglycerols, not only within themselves, you see how these are nice. Look at how, how they can pack together nice. These carbons, they can all fit in, in line with each other, and they can all pack real nice. 
not only within this triacylglycerol, but other ones. If you put a whole bunch of them together, they can all line up. They can all fit in and pack real tight. But if you put that, that unsaturated fatty acid in there, it's going to kink it. And so the kink prevents them from packing tightly together. So triacylglycerols that have unsaturated fatty acid chains, the kinks, can't pack together as tightly, and these tend to be liquids at room temperature. These are oils. Because they can't pack together, okay, they have relatively lower melting points, so they're liquids at room temperature. If you have saturated fatty acids in your triacylglycerol, the saturated fatty acids, because there's no kinks, can pack together tightly, and these tend to be solid at room temperature, at least here. I mean, if you go to some other place where room temperature is, you know, 70 degrees, it might not be. Okay, so things like butter and lard, these are saturated fatty acids, right? Things like safflower oil, um, all your other oils, these are unsaturated. Fatty acids, yeah. So let's say when butter melts, what, what happens then? You just get, you hit its melting point and it turns to liquid. That's all. It doesn't change the structure. Right. You're not breaking it down. It's still the same. And it, it does have a relatively low melting point, right? I mean, yeah. you leave it out on the table, it, it melts. Right. Yeah. But, and, and we've been kind of educated as consumers, right, um, to understand that oils are better for us than these solid fats, right? Um, because they're unsaturated. Unsaturated fats are better for us. Right? We, we call them fats and oils because we associate a solid with a fat and the oil, of course, with the liquid. But in reality, structurally, they're the same. They're triacylglycerols. The only difference is the unsaturated fatty acids versus the saturated fatty acids. And the same thing that makes butter a solid, right? The same properties that make butter a solid, they're the same, same properties that hurt you when it's in your system. I mean, that's why you don't want it in your system. It has everything to do with being saturated with hydrogens, and um, you know the double carbon-carbon double bonds and unsaturated fats um, are, are points of reactivity. So, um, you know, the, the same properties that make it a solid at room temperature are the properties. That why you don't want it in your body. Okay? Everybody good so far? Now imagine if I if I gave you a this is a little aside here. If we go back and we look at our fatty acids, right? See this double bond and then both the lines are coming out on the same side? That means it's cis, right? But imagine what a trans would look like. If we had one coming out here and one coming out there. That's what a trans would look like, right? And basically, it would look pretty much the same as this. Imagine putting a, a line right here. I'll draw a double bond right there. There's our double bond. I got one going this way, one going that way. That's trans, right? But it's still unsaturated. So for a while, people were exploiting that. And they were saying, we've got unsaturated fats in our foods. Oh, come and get our unsaturated fats. They're so much better for you. And the FDA came on board and said, wait a minute. You have a trans configuration in your fat, not cis. You're deceiving the public. Because the structure of the trans is almost identical. Not, not quite. The bond angles are not exactly the same. But... The trans fat is just as bad for you, almost, as the saturated. So now, you can't just say, I have unsaturated fats. You have to say, how much of it is trans? How much is it the bad or not so good for you? So it was, it was very deceiving for a while, Re really bad. And of course, advertisers, you know, 
these people that are trying to sell you this junk, they got, they got no conscience. Okay? So, fats and oils are triacylglycerols. And the only difference between fats and oils is one is a liquid at room temperature, one is a solid. The reason for that is because of the presence or absence of the carbon-carbon double bonds. If you have the double bonds and you are unsaturated, your fatty acids cannot pack together as tightly. They end up as liquids. These are better for us. Now, there's, first of all, none of them are good, right? None of them are good for you. I'm not sitting up here preaching that. None of them are good for you. But if you're going to eat them, the better of the two is the unsaturated. And then, of course, if you're a saturated fat, they can uh, pack together tightly, um, and there are solids at room temperature. Just remember solids saturated. So that's how I always remember. <clears throat> okay? But boy, they taste good, don't they? They make stuff taste real good, don't they? Uh, I don't know why that is. Our taste buds are like just go ballistic for those. Um, and generally, we say, you know, we say that the carboxylic or that um, carbohydrates are held together by alpha-1,4, beta-1,4 glycosidic bond linkages. Lipids, generally, we look at this and we say esters. These are esters. Okay, so triacylglycerols are held together by esters, an uh, ester linkage. And we can have one ester, two, or three. Now, remember, we can also break that, right? You can hydrolyze that bond. Hydrolysis. We can break this bond back into the OH and the and the fatty acid. Questions? Anybody get this? Um, that's basically what this says. Okay, saturated oils or liquids and blah blah blah. So I mean, you can read all that. Um, Triacyl glycerols are hydrophobic. That means water hating, literally, they're hydrophobic. Um, they will coalesce together. Hydrophobic um, interactions actually push nonpolar molecules together. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about that when we hit proteins in a little bit. Um, but triacylglycerols, they're fat. Okay, they're fat. They're the adipocytes. Okay, these are specialized cells in adipose tissue. Um, they're they're long-term storage of energy. Um, but because they're hydrophobic, there's not a lot of water around. They're very compact. It's unlike the glycogen, where the glycogen was spherical, okay, and highly branched. But because all the glycerol molecule, or all the um, glycogens, have OH groups on them, so they hydrogen bond a lot of water. So you'll find a reasonable amount of water, hydrogen bound, in the core of, of, of glycogen. You don't see that here. Triacylglycerols, adipose tissue, they're, they're, they're not. They're, there's no water in there at all. Okay, For the same reason when you spit in the lake and it stays together and floats around, the water just doesn't get along with it because they're opposites. One's polar, one's not polar. It's like oil and water. You can, you can store, this is, this is the stuff I don't like. You can store the equivalent amount of energy in about one-eighth of glycogen's volume. So, I mean, one-eighth of glycogen to store the same amount of energy, and it stores more energy. 9.3 kilocalories per gram versus 4.1. That's over twice. So not only is it more efficiently stored and you have more of it, but you got to work harder to get rid of it. Twice and a half, almost two and a half. So you got to burn through your short-term storages, right, before you get to your long-term storage. In reality, that's not true. Metabolism, metabolism. Right now, you're burning fat, whether you know it or not. It's just the ratio of how much you're getting from carbohydrates versus fat. And generally, fat... Um, you get energy from fat uh, from a process called beta oxidation. Okay, but still, I see all these these diets, right? Uh, South Beach diet, you know, drink this five gallons of whatever it is and lose 40 pounds by next week. It's all bad. It's all bad. 
okay? Two, two and a half pounds a week is all it's safe to lose. And even then you push it, all right? Very simple, you wanna lose weight, burn more than you take in. Simple, simple. That doesn't mean starve yourself. These diets, your body is a machine and it's designed to work. You start taking away stuff that doesn't work efficiently and you get sick. That's my lecture. Fats, um, yeah, insulation, we know that. They're waterproof feathers on ducks. You know, the fats are they're not good conductors of uh, heat, so um, they're good they're good for insulation. What can we do with triacetylglycerols? Well we know this already. Okay, we have fats and oils plus water. We break that apart in the glycerol and the fatty acids. If you go back and look at um, hydrolysis of esters, this is what we have. This is it. This is nothing more than hydrolysis of esters. That's all it is. You're just going to split water. You're going to add OH across to the carboxylic acid and the H uh, to the glycerol. Sap saponification, this is nothing more than base catalyzed hydrolysis of esters. These are all reactions we already studied, right? And I know that stuff's flying by you at a pretty good rate. Very little of it's sinking in, right? But that's what it is. That's Base hydrolysis of esters is this reaction rate. Last thing we have is unsaturated fats plus H2. We can turn them into saturated fats. That's almost the very first reaction that we saw in OCAM for alkene. That's H2 addition to alkenes, where we changed our alkene into an alkane. It's called hydrogenation. You see it all the time, don't you? Hydrogenated fats. I don't know why someone would do that. Because you have unsaturated, which is the better of the two, and you're turning it into saturated. We have some more examples. Okay, everybody good? Waxes. Waxes. It seems to me that somewhere I saw a question on waxes. Hmm. Hmm. It's nothing more than an ester, but it looks different to you because on each side of the ester you have a long hydrocarbon chain on both sides. That's a wax. We all know what waxes are. I don't know the properties. We might not know what they are. This is what they are. But we know the properties of a wax. We know what we use them for. Wax keys, wax, you know, wax lip bombs, all the other all wax. Okay? When you see it, as I said, when, right? It's nothing more than the ester linkage, but then there's like six or seven carbons here and six or seven carbons going the other way. And it looks odd to you, okay? It looks strange to see the ester linkage with long carbon chains on both sides. What? Okay? Waxes. Esters with long carbon chains on both sides. That's it. That's all. So, yeah, there you are. Long chain alcohol, long chain fatty acid. Looks kind of odd. There's examples in the book. I hope. Phospholipids. Okay.
there's going to be a lot of recognition. Okay, you're going to see a lot of molecules up here. I, I know that. You're seeing a lot of things. I'm not concerned that you know the names of all of these different types of molecules that I'm throwing at you. Okay? I want you to recognize basic things. Okay? I want you to be able to recognize a wax. You don't have to name it. I want you to be able to recognize the triacylglycerol. And tell me, is it saturated? Is it unsaturated? But you don't have to name the fatty acid chains that are on them. Okay? Recognize saponification. A good rule of thumb, you see any biomolecule with NaOH, saponification is a very good guess. Because anytime you have NaOH with a biomolecule, pretty much it's saponification. Phospholipids, or phosphoglycerides, we have our same glycerol molecule. Now remember, our glycerol is a three carbon chain, and each of the carbons has an OH group. Right? Two of the OHs are esterified to fatty acids. Normal, just like you would see in a diacylglycerol. The third one is not to a fatty acid. It's actually to a phosphate group. So there's your Q right there when you see the P and the O's. See right here. There it is. And then there's an alcohol attached to the phosphate group, and this is usually going to be an amino alcohol, so it's going to contain, you'll see the NH2 or NH3 in there. You know, amines up. These are phosphoglycerides. And, and now I'm, I'm going into a lot more than what's actually in the little book, but, I mean, you see things here. Look at phosphatide A. Look at ATE, ATE, carboxylate. If you propanated right here, you'd have phosphatidic acid, just like the carboxylic acids versus the carboxylates, right? Again, you don't have to recognize this. But look at diacyl 3 phosphate, diacylglycerol 3 phosphate. It's all right there. That's what I love about biochemistry. It's not like organic. They don't feel the need to confuse you with all of these things. You know, it's, it's all pretty straightforward. Here are some examples. Um, you can take a real quick look. I don't want it to freak you guys out, so we'll just blow right through. But here they are, you know, phosphatide right here. Here's serine, an amino acid we'll see in just a minute. Phosphatidyl serine, esterified right here. Some examples. The steroids. Again, just recognition. Okay, just recognition. Steroids have a very characteristic structure cholesterol. All steroid hormones that are produced in our body come from precursor cholesterol. So you will see the characteristic four fused ring system in cholesterol. Cholesterol gets kind of a bad, bad rap. Okay? It's absolutely essential. We have to have it. We have to have cholesterol. But just like anything else, too much of it's bad. Too much is bad. Everything in moderation, right? Cholesterol, precursor in the biosynthesis of steroid hormones, vitamin D, bile salts, all of these very, very important. It's a component in membranes where it adds both uh, it can regulate both rigidity and flexibility. It's very, very important. But you don't want it in, uh, in excess. Uh, this is the characteristic four-fusoring system. And no, you don't have to memorize all these positions. 
I'm just giving you a little extra here. Okay? All the carbons and all the rings are numbered. All of the external branch points are numbered. But this is how you tell you're dealing with it with a, uh, a steroid. You see this characteristic four fused ring system. Three six-membered rings, one five-membered ring. Interestingly, cholesterol has an OH group on it, so it's actually a sterol. It's actually a sterol. Okay, but <coughs> steroid has stuck, so they stay with it. Recognize that. Just know that when you see that, you may see a question, for example, it might say, um, which of the following is a non-fatty acid containing lipid? And then you just look for the four fused ring system of cholesterol. You know that those are that steroids are non-fatty acid containing. Okay. Again, recognition. This is where we're going to be primarily on the next exam. Recognition of these groups. We're going to ask you to actually name. Here are some examples of, of some steroids. Um, progesterone, you know what that is? What's progesterone? What is it? Yeah, it's a pregnancy hormone, right? Females release it when they're pregnant. I guess unless you're a seahorse, don't the males and seahorses have um, um, Yeah, progesterone. Look at look at the ending here. Own. What does that make it? Ketone, there it is. There's another one. Um, yeah, that's the hormone that's released when, when females become pregnant. And when you take the pill, you... Doesn't the pill contain... Yeah, the pill contains progesterone, so that tricks your body into thinking that, that you're pregnant, and so you don't release eggs. Uh, testosterone, ketone, again, right? Um, this is um, the... Um, uh, hormone that <clears throat> confirms uh, male traits and uh, 17 beta estradiol. I'm not going to go into why it's 17 beta up and down above the ring. Um, estradiol, diol, D, alls, two OLs, two alcohols. Contrary to popular belief, there's no such thing as a hormone called estrogen. Uh, estrogen is a general term used to describe any number of hormones that confirm female traits or characteristics. Um, generally, when you say estrogen, you're referring to estradiol, but it could refer to a mixture of estradiol, estriol, you know, all of these different types of female hormones. Um, aldosterone, again, ketones, uh, cortisol, colic acid, uh, these are all um, uh, hormones. Um, whose biosynthesis started with precursors um, uh, and cholesterol. So you can see the characteristic four fused ring system. Um, I was always kind of amazed at, at the subtle difference between this and this. They're, they're not terribly different. I mean, this whole half, you know, this, this, everything's the same right up to here. The only difference really is in this last ring, you know, between the two. Considering this is male and this is female, and the obvious differences between the two, um, there's not a huge difference in the, in the molecule. <clears throat> to our peptides and proteins. And <clears throat> we get back to some normalcy here. Back to um, structural features uh, that define um, this particular class. Again, there's a lot here, you know, to read and stuff, and you can read that. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to kind of jump through it. Um, but technically, there's a difference between peptides and proteins. We're not going to um, differentiate them. Um, we will refer to them equally as polypeptides or proteins. Um, the protein's uh, monomeric unit, or the 
the unit that makes up protein is called an amino acid. And <coughs> there are 20 standard uh, amino acids. And again, this standard, this, this just applies to amino acids that are commonly found in proteins. That doesn't mean that other amino acids don't exist. It just means that when you look at proteins, there's this reoccurring number uh, of amino acids. Now, you don't have to memorize the amino acids unless you're planning on taking 207 with me. Then you will memorize them. Um, the amino acids are broken down uh, by this shaded area, this, this what we call side chain. All amino acids have the same basic structural feature, amino acid, right? So here's our amino, you know that amine, right? And here's our acid, which used to be a carboxylic acid. But again, this particular table shows what the amino acids look like in the body. And at physiological pHs, that carboxyl group is ionized to a carboxylate. So it shows it that way. 7.4, the NH2 is protonated to NH3, and the carboxyl group is deprotonated. Um, so they all have the same basic structure. They have you know, the C double bond O, then they have the carbon here, and then the amino group. And what's hooked at this, what we call the alpha carbon, is what differentiates the side chain of side group. Okay? Um, you don't have to memorize these, but notice some of them are aromatic. There's an aromatic benzene. Benzene. Another benzene. We have acidic and basic. Again, here's aspartate, glutamate, basic residues, lysine, arginine, histidine. Histidine, very important in hemoglobin, O2, tra uh, O2 transport protein. They all have this same basic structure right here. Okay? And this carbon, which is located right next to the carbonyl group, is called the alpha position. We didn't cover that when we talked about carbonyl chemistry in organic. And we saw the carbonyl group how many times? We saw it in aldehydes, ketones, esters, amides, you name it. We saw it. But when you see a C double bond O, the carbon right next door is called the alpha carbon. If there was another carbon, it would be the beta. We generally don't label heteroatoms, so we wouldn't generally refer to heteroatoms as anything other than carbon. We wouldn't call this necessarily an alpha oxygen, okay? But this is definitely an alpha carbon because it's right next door. All amino acids have the C double bond O, single bond O, the alpha carbon, and the amino group. The alpha carbon in all amino acids has a single hydrogen bound to it. So the alpha carbon in amino acids has, they already have their bond, their three bonds, three out of the four defined. It's what's at that fourth position that differentiates and identifies the amino acid. It's called its side group, side chain, R group, all kinds of names for that. Now, at physiological pH, I already told you that the carboxyl, carboxylic acid is deprotonated to the carboxylate, and the amino group is protonated to its positive form. So when you look at this, you have a positive on one end and a negative on the other. It cancels out. This is called the Zwitter ion. And Zwitter, I believe in German, means double ion or duplicate ion, some, something like that. Double ion. You're going to need to see, you're going to need to pick this out. Okay? You're going to need to pick this out somewhere. Exam, quiz, lab, somewhere. Okay? When your carboxylate 
negative, and your amino is positive. That's your Zwitter. It's the neutral form of the amino acid for most of them. Some of these R groups actually have ionizable groups as well. But for the most part, the Zwitter ion is the neutral form of the amino acid. Okay. Now, the amino acids can be represented by one or three letter designation. I just give you this, just so you have it. You ever need it? Obviously, three letter designation, one letter. <clears throat> Again, we do identify the amino acids by the characteristics of the um, R group or the side chain. Um, if it's, you know, aromatic, if it's polar, nonpolar, acidic, basic, this is what classifies the amino acid. It's the only thing that can classify it because everything else is the same. Again, you do not have to memorize these. Here they are neutral polar amino acids because all of these groups usually have an OH on them or a carbonyl group. We know those carbonyl groups are polar. Just kind of qualitatively, you should be able to look at this and say, oh, that OH group, that's, that's polar. So that's going to be a polar amino acid. Acidic, basic amino acid. All the amino acids, if you look at the alpha carbon, if you look at the alpha carbon, all amino acids have this, this, and this. That's three different groups with one bonding position left. This R group does not match any of these in any amino acid except one, glycine, where it's a hydrogen. So other than glycine, which has two hydrogens on the alpha carbon, all other amino acids have four different groups attached to the alpha carbon, which makes them chiral. Right, makes them chiral. Amino acids are chiral except for glycine because glycine's R group is hydrogen, which is kind of incorrect, right? Because we learn R groups as alkyl groups. This side chain. So they are stereo, they have stereoisomers, and the non superimposable mirror images are called enantiomers. We know that. A right and left hand are enantiomers. We know what L and D stands for, dextrorotary, levorotary, or rotatatory, as it is in this book. How do we do it? Same way we always did it, Fischer projection. Most oxidized carbon at the top, we're going to have the substituted group at the bottom. If the amino group is on the left, it's the L. If it's on the right, it's the D. Only L isomers are found in proteins. I love that. L, living. Right? This is nothing more than a Fischer projection. That's all that is. It's complete with the wedges to show the horizontal lines coming out and the vertical going back, just like we learned. So when you go to the health food store and you see L-alanine or l gly or not, I couldn't have L-glycine, right? L-tryptophan, whatever you're buying, that's it. Don't let them sell you any D. At least not in proteins. Now, D-isomers do exist, though. I mean, they just don't, you don't find them in proteins. 
So, how do we form our proteins? How do we form our peptide bonds? This is a dehydration reaction. Surprise, right? Are, are we trying to, we getting it now that most assembling processes are dehydration? Losing water and forming the bond? These anabolic processes and most breakdown processes or catabolic processes are hydrolysis, coming across the double bond, cutting them off, or breaking water and breaking the, the, the original linkage. In peptide bond formation, you have a reaction between the carboxylate on one amino acid and the amino group on another. It's dehydration, so just remove H2O, just remove that, and draw the bond directly across. See that? H2O goes away, we produce our bond directly across. This is our peptide bond right here. That's our peptide bond which is also an amide linkage, right? From OCAN, C double bond O, single bond nitrogen. Primary, secondary, tertiary, amide. It's an amide linkage right there. That would be a secondary, right? We got this one occupied, and we got that one, we got one hydrogen. This is a peptide bond, and it links adjacent amino acids in the formation of proteins. Now, once the amino acids are linked together, we don't call them amino acids anymore. We refer to them as residues. This is an amino acid residue now, and so is this. Oh, set it right there. Okay? Carboxyl groups, carboxylates, react with amino groups and dehydration reactions to produce peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are also called amide linkages. We look at this and we imagine this peptide bond this, this peptide growing and growing, adding more amino acids in a line and adding more in the front, back, it doesn't matter. But sooner or later, when it stops, when the assembly of amino acids ceases, you will have one end that's got a carboxylate and one end that has an amino on it. Are we in agreement? No matter when you stop assembling, Say you got a hundred amino acids and you assemble them all together and you're all done. One end is going to have that on it and one's going to have that on it. Right? This is called the end terminal and the carboxyl terminal. And by convention, we always think of the end terminal as being the front and the carboxyl terminal as being from the back. So when we read the sequence of amino acids, we go from the end terminal to the carboxyl terminal. N or C. Peptides are always written and named, just like we read, left to right, end terminal on the left, carboxyl terminal on the right. And I know that that's just a relative thing because I can take that and turn it sideways and then the end terminal will be on the bottom carboxyl terminal will be on the top, but we read left to right, so why screw things up? Does everybody see that? Everybody good with that? All right. These are some of the functions of proteins, and you can read those um, on your own. Um, their function as, as catalyst um, is probably most important when it's an enzyme. Structural movement, defense, regulation, transport, a whole bunch of stuff. Proteins are very important. 
I would argue that they're the most important, even more important than DNA, because you can survive with, with mutations in your DNA. But if you have a mutation in a protein, and that protein is vital to your life, like, I don't know, hemoglobin, O2 transport, you're going to die. No, no ifs, and buts about it. Again, there's a lot of information here, okay? More than, than, than you're required to know. But sometimes by giving you a little bit extra, it makes the whole convention a little easier. So I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you what I want you to know on it, right? Um, there is a hierarchy of protein structure, okay? And, and, it, and it goes primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Now, the primary structure um, in protein, in the hierarchy of protein structure, is simply the sequence of amino acids. That's all it is. There are um, machines that will give you the sequence of, of, of amino acids in a protein. It digests the protein and it figures out what amino acids are next to which amino acids. Then you can go to the, the amino acid store or wherever and you can buy those amino acids and you tip them upside down and you put them in a peptide synthesizer, you turn the thing on and 16 later you come back and you got a bunch of your protein. It's a beautiful thing. Um, <clears throat> this is nothing more than the sequence, though, the primary sequence of amino acids. And in reality, that doesn't really exist on its own. You never see the protein in its primary structure because as it comes off the ribosomes, as it's being um, translated, the amino acids are being added one at a time, one at a time. And as they're added, this complex interaction and folding is occurring as each amino acid is added in the sequence. And so if you could, and you could grab the, the, uh, um, the end terminal, and you could grab the carboxyl terminal, and you could pull it, stretch it out, and you could hold it there, that would be your primary structure. But the minute you let it go, it would fold right back up. Okay. So the primary structure doesn't really exist in and of itself, because you never see the thing straight out in, in its open form. Nothing more than the sequence of amino acids. If, if you look at the um, primary structures of the same protein in different species of, of animals, um, anytime you have the same, now remember, there's the amino terminal, there's the carboxyl terminal, and then we say amino acid 1, amino acid 2, 3, 4, 5. Whenever you have the same amino acid in the same position, that's called sequence homology. Okay, it's called sequence homology. And, I mean, but it's not just that you have, you know, five alanines. Uh, this, this, you know, this protein has five alanines and this protein has five alanines. No, they have to be in the same spot. Okay, they have to be in the same spot. And some people use this to track evolution across species, um, with the premise being, that you know, we all started from a, a single organism and that over time, random mutations occur and those mutations are visualized in the sequence, the primary sequence of these proteins. Right? Now, I'm not here to debate you know, evolution versus creationism, but we teach evolution, teach the scientific method. <coughs> yeah, we do. I had to think about that for a minute. Did I just say something right? Am I going to get in trouble? Um, <clears throat> we don't really deal with this, though. We don't care too much about it. But it just exists. There's a lot of flaws with the theory, obviously. But um, that's, the sequence homology is something that's kind of important. Again, cytochrome C. Right here, cytochrome C is um, one of the... Um, oldest known proteins. It's a, it's a cytochrome, um, it's a redox protein in the electron transport chain. And it's believed to, to uh, you know, be as old, when, when, uh, when organisms began to respire, breathe air, um, is about when they believe this thing came around. And, and, and they're justifying it with the fact that you can take cytochrome C out of many, many different organisms that diverged, you know, millions or even hundreds of millions of years ago. And there's a, a significant amount of sequence homology in that. 
even more on the histone proteins that, um, that fold your DNA. Secondary structures, we have two of them, um, alpha helices and beta sheets. So the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. And the primary structure is formed by the peptide bond. That's how you get the primary structure. The peptide linkage is what creates the primary structure. The secondary structures are alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Now, alpha helices are like springs. You can think of them as springs. Um, interestingly enough, they're, they're right-handed. So if you point your thumb in the direction that the helix is rising, and, and you see the direction that your hand closes when, you're, when, your fing when your hand is in that, or not your hand, your fingers, when your hand's in that configuration, that's a right-handed helix versus a left. Okay. Um, and interestingly, um, they, they seem to be, any helices that show up in proteins seem to be right-handed. Um, there is a pitch on them, and there's so many residues per turn and all that, but what I want you to know, and again, you can read this, an alpha helix is basically a spring, and it's stabilized by hydrogen bonding. We know what hydrogen bonding is. Hydrogen bonding it are these, these kind of opposites attract interactions that result from permanent dipoles in molecules. There's permanent polarity. Now, a picture is better than words. So let's take a look at it. We have carbonyl carbons, C double bond O, carbonyl groups, C double bond O. We know those are polar because oxygen and carbon do not have the same electronegativity as a periodic table. They don't have the same electronegativity, right? Oxygen's more electronegative because it's closer to fluorine. So you have a slightly negative oxygen, slightly positive carbon. That's going to interact with a nitrogen and hydrogen bond, NH. We know that's polar, right? That's polar because nitrogen and hydrogen do not have the same electronegativity. Nitrogen's closer to fluorine, so nitrogen's negative, hydrogen's positive. So what this is, the thing that stabilizes the helix, is the interaction of a slightly negative oxygen on C double bond O, carbonyl, with a slightly positive hydrogen on the amino group. And there are four amino acids away. So if, if this is carbonyl oxygen on, on amino acid residue number two, it's going to interact with the amino nitrogen and hydrogen on amino acid six, separated by four amino acids. The key here is that alpha helices are stabilized by hydrogen bonding amongst the main chain. Look at the identity of the amino acid hasn't even come, in, come into account yet. It's not even important yet. And you can see that when you look down a helix, look at those R groups. Those R groups are sticking out the outside of our spring, almost inviting interactions with another spring with its amino acids. Okay? So, alpha helix is a spring stabilized by hydrogen bonding along the main chain. That's different from the primary. The primary structure is the sequence of amino acids, and it's stabilized by the amide bond. That's what forms it. Our first secondary structure, hydrogen bonding on the main chain only for alpha helices. And there's a lot of information here. And if you see, if you see these ribbons, you know, on the cover of textbooks or something, that means alpha helix. So you see them sometimes on, on some uh, biochem textbooks. That's what it means. That little ribbon means, hey, I got an alpha, hel uh, alpha helix here. Beta pleated sheets. Beta pleated sheets are just like what you think. They're like pleats, right? Like pleats you'd see in a skirt, right? That's what they are. 
There are two types of beta sheets. There's parallel and anti-parallel. And in order for you to determine which is which, you have to get the direction of the peptide. Now, remember, there's an amino terminal and a carboxyl terminal on every peptide. So, you look for N-C-alpha C-carbonium. N-C-alpha C-carbonium, N-C-alpha C-carbonium. This is going to tell you the direction of your peptide. Now watch, we'll see one right here. Pick a nitrogen, bang, I'll pick this one right here. N-C-alpha, yeah, that's the alpha carbon. How do I know that? Because it's got the R group on it, right? The alpha carbon carries the R group. N-C-alpha C-carbonium, N-C-alpha C-carbonium. So this peptide is running in this direction, from top to bottom, this one. N-C-alpha, that is not an alpha carbon. It's a carbonyl, right? N-C-alpha, C-carbonyl, N-C-alpha. So, this one's running in this direction. This strand right here is running in this direction. This one is running in this direction. They're anti-parallel. See that? Question? No question? You sure? Ask your question. What is it? No. No, they're two separate strands. Separate strands. Look at this one. NC alpha C carbonyl, NC alpha. Again, you can tell the alpha carbon because it's got the R group on it. You can tell the carbonyl because got you better be able to tell the carbonyl. Right, see double window. NC alpha C carbonyl, NC alpha C carbonyl, NC alpha. This strand right here is moving this way. NC alpha C carbonyl, NC alpha. This strand right here is moving in the same direction. This is parallel. Okay. Look at the orientation of the bonds. I, we have a better picture that shows it in the next one. Uh, see that orientation? Does everybody see how to determine what the direction of the peptide is? Here's a better one. Now these arrows cheat and tell you which way they're going. Okay. N-C-alpha C-carbonyl, N-C-alpha C-carbonyl, N-C-alpha C-carbonyl. This one's going that way, and the arrows are correct. If you look and you see, this one is going this way, this one's going this way, this one's going this way, and this one's here, etc. Now, generally, you see, um, you know, these, these beta sheets can be several layers thick. Okay, this one is a beta pleated sheet that only has three, three layers involved. Okay, um, but they can be several layers thick. And you generally don't see a mixture of parallel versus anti-parallel in the same, in the same group of, of, of beta pleats. Okay, in other words, they're either all parallel or it's all anti-parallel. You don't have this and all of a sudden have another strand going here. You have anti-parallel up there and then parallel down here. You don't see too much, too often. But if you look at the hydrogen bonding here, the hydrogen bonding is between carbonyl oxygens and amino hydrogens. Slightly positive, slightly negative, okay? This is non-covalent, right? Because they're not sharing electrons. It's non-covalent. But look at how straight these are. You see how straight? These, these atoms are all in a straight line. That makes that bond very strong. Not very, very strong, but stronger than this one. These look like they're straight, but they're not. This NH wants to be straight up. This C double bond O wants to be straight down. So the interaction here, it kind of tweaks them and bends them toward each other. Does everybody get what I'm saying? 
They start out like, like this, and then they're, they're tweaked like that. And whenever you bend the bond, it weakens it. So these are weaker. These hydrogen bonds are weaker than the antiparallel. So when you see antiparallel strands, you know that they're stronger. They're more strongly bound than they are if you see parallel strands. And generally, um, they're represented with arrows. So when you see, uh, you know, like uh, alpha helix was represented with the um, ribbon, these are represented with, with arrows, look like that. And the arrows point in the same direction, meaning it's parallel, opposite direction. And Here's an example. We look. This one's not as easy to differentiate, but I know that the blue one's nitrogen. I know that this is a carbonyl because the oxygens are universally red. Um, so I have N, C alpha, no, that's my carbonyl. N, C alpha, C carbonyl. The gold walls are the R group. So you can see the direction and determine the direction of um, the, um, the strands, of each strand. And unlike our alpha helix, okay, the hydrogen bonding, it, 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 they're not located only four uh, amino acids away. It is still hydrogen bonding between carbonyl oxygens and amino hydrogen. It's still that hydrogen bonding. But these two amino acids could be located very, very, very far apart from each other in the primary structure. You could have the the structure running around, you know, running around here, and then it comes through here. And then it runs around out here and up here, it comes back through and does this, and let me make sure I'm going to get it going the right way. And see how the, this one's going to go this way, it comes back through. And then it messes around up here, maybe goes way up here and comes around, and then it comes back through. So the hydrogen bonding, although it's still hydrogen bonding on the main chain, is between amino acids that could be located very far apart in the primary sequence. Okay? So, primary structure, sequence of amino acids stabilized by amide bonds or peptide bonds. They could be referred to both as well. Secondary structures, there's only two of them, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. They are stabilized by hydrogen bonding on the main chain. These oxygens and, and hydrogens are on the main chain. Look at the R groups. These gold balls are sticking up or down below the sheet. Again, available. You can almost predict what's going to happen. You're going to have these secondary structures interacting and producing the tertiary structure, the functional protein. Okay. These are not functional proteins. Okay. They're just secondary structures. There are others. There are super secondary and stuff like that. I just want you to know alpha helices and beta sheets, and it's hydrogen bonding, but the hydrogen bonding is between the main chain. The R groups and the actual identity of the amino acid hasn't even come into play yet. It doesn't even matter what the identity is. Tertiary structures. Tertiary structures are functional proteins. This is the first structure that has a function. These are functional proteins. They have complex and unique three-dimensional configurations. Their topography and uh, uh, surface is generally related, uh, directly related to their function. These result from R group interactions. Finally, the identity of the amino acid has something to do with the structure. These are just tertiary structures, some features of tertiary structures. What kind of interactions? govern tertiary structure. We have four. The first one is hydrophobic interaction. 
Hydrophobic interactions is a major driving force in protein structure determination. When you spill, when oil is spilled in, in water, in the ocean, right? When you spill oil in water, oil is nonpolar and relatively non-charged. In fact, it's not. There's no distribution of charge. In other words, the individual oil molecules are not particularly attracted to each other. They're not. So why do they, why do they get together? Well, the water forces them. Okay? The water forces the oil together. And we're not going to go into why, but this is hydrophobic interactions. It has to do with entropy and this water cage around uh, the oil, at the interface between the oil and the water. There are less molecules stuck in it if they push everything together rather than having to surround individual particles. But hydrophobic interactions, these are by far the most important factor in protein structure determination. You disrupt hydrophobic interactions and you disrupt the function of the protein. Next is electrostatic interactions. We know what that means. That's a fancy word for opposites attract. Only in biochem, we don't say they're electrostatic. We call them something really cool, like salt bridges. Okay? Opposites attract, salt bridge. That's what it is. We have hydrogen bonds. We know what that is. Hydrogen bonding is these non-covalent interactions that result from permanent dipoles and polar bonds. For us, the C double bond O and the NH, pretty much. There's others, but these are the ones we care about. Hydrophobic, electrostatic, hydrogen bonds. Last one, covalent. Covalent interactions, there's only one really, and it's a disulfide bridge. Disulfide bridges. It's from the interaction of sulfurs on cysteines. <clears throat> Cysteine, amino acid, has sulfur. So, we have primary structure, sequence of amino acids, amide linkage. Secondary structures, alpha helices and beta sheets, stabilized by hydrogen bonding on the main chain. Tertiary structures, functional proteins, stabilized by hydrophobic interactions, electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonding, and covalent. Notice I keep saying that every time we go new and I say, oh, primary, secondary, tertiary, because these are the things that are important. We're not going to ask you to name a protein, but we, you know, I'm going to want you to know what a primary structure is and what body creates the primary structure. Here's an example, <clears throat> right? Here we have some um, ionic interactions, which we call salt bridges, opposites attract. Um, down here we have some hydrogen bonding. Um, that would actually probably be <clears throat> an example of hydrogen bonding, right? Because it involves hydrogen. Uh, a salt bridge, really, an ionic, is, is a fully developed plus and a fully developed minus versus a hydrogen bonding where they're just slightly positive, slightly negative. There's our disulfide. But look at the primary structure. See, here's an alpha helix. Here's a connector region. Here's another alpha helix, connector region, alpha helix, alpha helix. Now, you can see how 
how the various distances are stabilized. I mean, look at how far apart these distances are in the primary sequence. Look at this one. How far away is this from this point? I mean, almost the entire length of the peptide, right? And, they, and they're stabilized and they come together um, to produce that functional protein. Uh, like I said, the, the, front, the, the, the surface of a, of, a, of a protein, a properly folded protein, is very complex. Lots of valleys and crevices and bumps and lumps and all that. All that means something when it comes to the function. And if you disrupt any of these, you can, you can, you know, you can make a valley where there's supposed to be a little bump. And that could have devastating effects, i.e. sickle cell anemia. That's, that's caused from a single point mutation in the beta chain of hemoglobin. One single tiny little change. That's it. Quaternary structures, we don't have to know too much about them, um, other than the fact that quaternary structures are interacting tertiary structures. Okay? They're interacting tertiary structures. They are stabilized by the same forces that stabilize tertiary, i.e. hydrophobic, electrostatic, um, hydrogen bonding, and covalent. A good example of a quaternary structure is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made up of basically four myoglobins. Myoglobin is an O2 transport protein to the muscle. You put four of those together and you have a hemoglobin, a blood a O2 transport protein in um, red blood cells. A lot of good reasons for this. I mean, you can read those, you know. Again, you're getting a little more than you bargained for. Uh, there they are, okay. Again, this is what they are sequence here. All the stuff we've been going through here. A disruption of any of these forces can affect the overall function of the molecule or the protein. Here's some examples. Here's a primary structure. Notice just the sequence. We use the three letter designations here. Secondary structures, you see the little spiral, alpha helix. Here's our beta sheets. Here's a tertiary structure. Notice interacting beta sheets. Those are parallel, right? See how the arrows are pointing in the same direction? Parallel sheets interacting with some alpha helices. And then here's two of them. There's one tertiary, there's the other. And they're interacting. Quaternary. You can hydrolyze proteins. What a surprise, right? You can take the protein, you can split water, you can add it across the amide linkage, and you can create the amino acids back again. Um, you can um, digest, we call that protein digestion. Um, you can uh, hydrolyze the protein into smaller peptides and then ultimately into the amino acids. The amino acids are stored at various amino acid pools around the body. Denaturing. Um, <clears throat> this is a permanent loss of, of activity, um, protein activity. Um, when you denature a protein, you can get it back. And the best example I can give you is when you cook an egg, you're denaturing the egg albumin. And you know what that looks like. When you crack that egg open and it goes into the frying pan, that, that kind of slimy substance, that's the albumin, that's the protein. And when you cook it, you know what that looks like at the end, right? No amount of money or, or no amount of time can convert a fried egg back into the original slimy egg albumin. All right, so I guess you could feed it to another chicken, have him lay another egg and get another egg. I guess you could do it that way. That wouldn't, it sounds bad though, because the chicken's eating chicken. Um, but denaturing is a permanent, irreversible process. And um, it's, it's caused by disrupting one of those forces, the hydrophobic, the um, electrostatic, the uh, covalent, or uh, hydrogen bonding. 
And there's a lot of different things that can um, cause that. Okay. Uh, organic solvents, guess what? Ethanol, uh, i.e. drinking alcohol, okay? alcohol poisoning can disrupt the, uh, the protein um, folding. pH, a lot of different, a lot of different uh, denaturing conditions. Heavy metal ions, I don't know, maybe you guys are too young, but they used to put lead in the paint, you know, when I was a kid, so the paint would chip off and people would eat it and they'd get lead poisoning, kind of, all kinds of stuff. Temperature, the temperature goes up, you know, um, you, you, your body detects an antigen in your hypothalamus, which can controls your body's internal environment, says, oh, um, we have an invader, let's increase our temperature because we've learned over time that increasing the temperature kills the organism, whatever it may be. Well, there are some that it doesn't. There's some that are, that are not sensitive to heat, so they just keep raising the temperature and raising the temperature and raising the temperature. And, and this is a problem because that increase in temperature increases the kinetic energy and it can break those stabilizing bonds that keep those proteins together. And you will literally start frying yourself. Uh, frying your protein, so that's why they got to throw you in the television. All these.